Are we on? There we go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Leiser. I know many of you. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to this policy talk called Fiscal Challenges Facing the Next Administration. Um, today, we are very happy to welcome Mark Goldwine, who's the Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director for the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, he guides and conducts research on a wide array of topics related to fiscal policy and the federal budget. He's frequently quoted in a number of major media outlets and works regularly with members of Congress and their staff on budget-related issues. Uh, previously, Mark served as the Associate Director of the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, otherwise known as the Fiscal Com Commission, and Senior Budget Analyst on the Joint Select Committee on Deficit Reduction, the Super Committee. I always love these government titles of of policy-making uh, bodies. He also conducted research for the Government Accountability Office, GAO, the World Bank, the Historian's Office at the Social Security Administration, and the Institute of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley. And as many of you might know, Mark is here on a very special day. Um, the Biden administration has just released its latest uh, fiscal year 2025 budget proposals. So we can talk a little bit about that, although we don't necessarily have a whole lot of detail as of right now, um, but as we know, a budget, especially in election year, is both a wish list and a political statement. So I look forward to our conversation about that. Uh, Mark will give us an opening presentation, and I think we're welcoming questions during this part of it. And then we'll talk about some of the uh, some of the issues in greater detail and have a question and answer section. Um, we have a number of questions that people have submitted uh, when they registered for this event, so we can do some of those, but we can also have a more um, free-flowing question and answer uh, during the presentation as well. So, uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Happy Budget Day, everyone. Happy Budget Day, everyone. I'm not going to get any, like, Happy Budget Day back. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here. As mentioned, um, we will do Q&A at the end, but if you have questions throughout, like I raise your hand, uh, we won't have a mic come around so that um, people can hear you if they're tuned in online, but raise your hand, I'll probably call on you unless it looks like your question's gonna be mean, then I'll ignore you. Uh, for starters, uh, I wanna let you know a little bit about myself, about my organization. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, doing budget policy. Uh, you heard um, you know, all the committees that I worked on, so I really have very deep experience in failing to fix our underlying fiscal situation. Um, I've worked on two nonpartisan commissions that, that uh, tried to do just that. One succeeded in putting together a plan that actually got pretty broad support, but just didn't make it to the finish line. The other didn't make it far past the start line. Uh, but other than that, uh, for the last 17 years, I've been at a group called the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, we are a DC-based think tank. Um, we are nonpartisan. Now, Technically, every think tank in D.C. is nonpartisan because it's the law. If you're not nonpartisan, you lose your tax status. But we're actually nonpartisan. Uh, our, our board is some of the top budget experts and former budget practitioners in the country from left, right, and center. Uh, one of our co-chairs is Leon Panetta. He was President Obama's Secretary of Defense. He was President Clinton's Chief of Staff. Another one is Mitch Daniels. He was President Bush's OMB Director. He's a Republican governor. A third one is Tim Penny. He's an uh, independent congressman from Minnesota. And then our board is just some of the top um, former members of Congress, heads of CBO and OMB and other three acronym organizations in Washington that, are, that really care about the budget. Uh, they disagree on a lot. They disagree on how big government should be. They disagree on what the tax code should look like. Um, but they agree that we ought to have a sustainable budget, which, which they generally define by our debt can't grow forever faster than our economy is growing. In good times, we ought to be reducing deficits. Understandably, there are times that borrowing is really important, especially, say, during a, a pandemic or during a recession or during a war. Um, but they, we generally advocate for lower borrowing. That's one part of what we do is advocacy. Most of what we do is education. Most of what we do is write papers and blogs and um, go around the country and have presentations. And we have online interactive tools. And uh, we write memos. And I, we go on the Hill and we talk to members of Congress. And we work with their staff to develop legislation, to understand the cost of legislation, and we work with the media. Most of what we do is educational. We try to explain the budget in ways that people can understand. Um, you know, the president's budget came out today, and I think the main document is 580-some pages or something like that. Uh, later today, and I know you guys are all already on our mailing list, but if not, you can go to CRFP.org. Later today, you'll get a paper that's more like seven pages that tries to explain the budget 
um, as thoroughly as possible in as few words as possible by using, um, by kind of focusing on, on the most important uh, parts, parts of it and explaining it in a digestible way. So that's a lot of what we do. We do, we advocate for responsible budgeting, we do analysis, we explain things, uh, and we serve as a watchdog role because believe it or not, sometimes members of Congress and the president like to cheat and say that they are being good in the budget when actually they're doing bad in the budget and we're there to kind of call the balls and strikes. Uh, we also have a special project that comes around once every four years. Um, it's like the Summer Olympics. Uh, called U.S. Budget Watch. This year we call it U.S. Budget Watch 2024. My guess is the next one we'll call U.S. Budget Watch 2028. Um, and this focuses on the presidential campaign. Most of what we do focuses on what's happening in Congress or what's happening with the White House. But this focuses on what's going to happen with the next president. And so we, we follow the campaign starting early in the primaries. Um, we explain their policies as they come out. We try to put estimates to those policies. Right, because it's really easy to go in the campaign and say, I think everybody should have free tuition at University of Michigan. But then you need to figure out, okay, how much does it cost to give everybody free tuition at University of Michigan? Right, so we go through their policies, we try to figure out their costs, we try to compare them to each other, we fact check them, uh, we, um, uh, we try to encourage them to avoid perpetuating budget myths. And again, we go around the country to try to talk about the many challenges and opportunities that they face. Sorry, excuse me. We're at high altitude here. Uh, so let me start by giving some basics in the federal budget. And again, if you have questions throughout this, feel free to raise your hand. The last full budget that we had, the last year that we've completed was fiscal year 2023. In fiscal year 2023, the federal government spent $6.5 trillion. Take out total spending, $6.5 trillion. In that same year, they raised about four and a half trillion. Anyone here accounting or math? Right, like you might notice there's uh, a gap here, right? We spent two trillion more than what we brought in in revenue. These are the unofficial numbers because of some quirky accounting stuff that you can ask me about if you care. Just trust me that they're, um, they're the better numbers. So we spent about two trillion more than we raised. Where'd that spending go? Well, all sorts of places. We spend on literally thousands of government programs. About a quarter of it is what we call discretionary. Uh, these are the programs that, for the most part, Congress appropriates every year. Every year, the Congress decides how much we're gonna spend on defense. That's half of that quarter. Every year, they decide how much we're gonna give through, for K through 12 education, how much we're gonna fund the EPA, the Department of Energy, uh, the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, things like that. Um, the federal workforce, almost all the federal workforce. These are under the discretionary budget, and these are decided every year. But three quarters of the budget isn't decided every, every year. Three quarters of the budget is mostly on autopilot. Either it's on a multi-year basis, or in most cases, on a permanent basis. Uh, the largest category, the largest single government program, is Social Security. Um, of that six and a half trillion, about 1.3 trillion was Social Security benefits. This mainly goes to the elderly, but it also goes to people with disabilities, uh, workers with disabilities. Uh, and it also goes to survivors, children survivors as well as adult survivors and elderly survivors. That's the largest government program. After that is Medicare, which actually goes to almost the same population but provides, Social Security gives you a check, Medicare gives you health care benefits, basically public insurance. After that is everything else we spend on health care. That's your Medicaid, which is uh, health insurance for low income, the Obamacare, ACA subsidies, which, which go a little bit higher at the ladder, and, and the children's health insurance program. And then we got everything else. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that everything else, the, your, your food stamps, your welfare programs, farm subsidies, military retirement. Pretty small share of the budget um, when, you, when you look at it. That's that dark blue next to the non-defense, about $1.1 trillion. And then last year, about 10% of the budget, about one of every $10, went not for some kind of new program, right? not for infrastructure, not for education, not for welfare, not for health care, but it went to just pay interest on our, on our debt. We went to pay bondholders um, in order to not ditch our debt, which, which we sold to them because we needed a loan. I, I want to focus in a little bit on this discretionary part, right? Because this is a big change for how things used to be. If you go back to 1970, and I apologize for looking backwards, but my eyes, it turns out, are not actually good to see numbers on that screen all the way back there. But if you go back to 1970, most of the budget, 60%, was discretionary. That meant that most of the budget was decided every year. 
you elected your member of Congress, you elected the president, um, and every year they decided how to, how to allocate the money. By 2000, that had fallen to a third. So by 2000, most of the budget, significantly most of the budget, was mandatory, was not decided by the person you elected. It was probably decided by the person that your parents elected, uh, maybe by the person your grandparents elected. Uh, last year, as I mentioned, it was, a, it was a quarter, and by 2053 on our current course, it's going to be a fifth. So separate from anything I'm about to tell you about deficits and debt and about uh, all this extra borrowing, one thing that's happening with the budget is it's becoming less democratic, little de-democratic over time. Less and less of the budget is in the hands or directly in the hands of the people that you're electing. And more and more of it is in the hands of people that um, may be long dead, right? It's, it was decisions made in the past that were continuing. Now what about the revenue side? That was the spending side. We spent six and a half trillion last year. We raised four and a half trillion. The other two trillion we borrow, right? And of that four and a half trillion, about half of it was from individual income taxes. I think this is the part of the tax code most people are familiar with. It's a progressive tax, so the richer you are, the more you pay. People that highest incomes pay 37% on their last dollar. Um, a, a large share of people um, pay nothing or even get something back. The lowest rate is 10%. Goes up incrementally. There's all sorts of credits, credits for children, credit for earned income, credit for, for college tuition. There's all sorts of deductions, whether it's from mortgage interest or your retirement account contribution or your charitable giving. There's all sorts of things that aren't included in the tax code, whether it's your health care benefits or um, interest bonds or things like that. There's special rates for capital gains. It's a very complicated tax, but it's a tax that mostly is paid by higher earners. Really, really most of this tax is paid by people in the top quarter uh, of the income spectrum, the top fifth even. Uh, the second largest tax, and the one that's the largest tax for most people, is the payroll tax. Um, if you, you know, ever look at a paycheck and you see that FICA that the government's taking, that's your federal insurance contribution amount. That's your payroll tax. It's basically a, most of the cases, flat tax on your wages that goes to pay for Social Security, Medicare, and in some cases, unemployment. You pay some, your employer pays some. In most cases, it's split evenly, although there's exceptions. Um, and again, even though this isn't the most revenue, it's the most tax that most people pay because anybody that works pays the payroll tax. Right? It doesn't matter if you, know, you worked one hour and you have $15 of income for the entire year, you're paying the payroll tax. Same as somebody that's making $150,000. Uh, I will say for Social Security, eventually your income gets high enough that you stop paying more in payroll tax. That's about $180,000 uh, this year. After that, we got the corporate tax, which is about 10% of all revenue. We spent a lot of time fighting about the corporate tax, but it's one of those things that's like, it's really important if you got rid of that, our deficit would be 400 billion bigger, but it's not that large a share of total, total revenue. And then everything else we talk about is just tiny, you know, cigarette taxes or gas taxes or the estate tax, which is the tax you pay if you, um, you know, or basically are a billionaire and you die. Uh, tariffs, like they got a lot of discussion, but they don't bring in a lot of money, at least not relate, relative to the income and payroll tax. So because of this large gap, we are borrowing about $2 trillion per year. Um, prior to the pandemic in 2019, we were borrowing $1 trillion a year. During the pandemic, we really ramped that up. We ramped that up mainly because we were providing support. We, were, we sent people three rounds of checks. We dramatically expanded unemployment benefits. We had that paycheck protection program for small businesses. We had aid to states. We had all sorts of money we were putting to the economy. Uh, there's a question over here if we get the mic, and I'll, I'll get to it when I finish this. But uh, we have all sorts of money we were putting into the economy, uh, in part to support the economy, but mainly to support people through the pandemic. And that boosted it up to $3 trillion a year. But now we're post-pandemic. We're post all that relief. And you can see, kind of going forward, we're at $1.5 trillion a year, headed to two, even $2.5 trillion a year. This is what we're borrowing annually. I've always been confused, especially like when we borrow from other countries on what the consequence is, because the standard of living, at least for me in my ignorant experience, has been the same, like no matter how much we're borrowing, um, except for like a little bit of inflation. So what's the consequence of that? That That is a great question, but I have like 15 slides probably just dedicated to that question. So I, I promise I am going to get to it. The question was, what are the consequences of, of borrowing? Um, and there's many of them. The one thing I'll say is that most of the consequences seem invisible because they're very diffuse. 
and they're very incremental, typically. And this is a consequence that people face in, in budgeting. Um, it's a little bit like climate change in the sense that um, nobody feels the effect of, you know, an additional ton of emissions. Be but like, everybody feels the effect 20 years down the road of the accumulation of, of emissions. I'm not saying debt is the same level of threat as climate change, but it's a similar situation where um, the benefits of deficits are actually very targeted, right? Because the benefit is you got a paycheck protection program or you got a $1,200, $1,400 check, but the costs are very diffuse. It's that everybody's standard of living is a little bit worse than it would have been accumulating over time. But uh, I'll spend about 15 slides on that out of my 412 total slides. Um, just joking. And if I still don't answer your question after those, ask me the same question again or ask it in a different way. And I got a question over here. We get them. The extent that Social Security deficit, if that's the right word, is included in this trillion, I've always been curious if we remove the cap on Social Security taxes, taxable income, and taxed everyone to the full extent of their earned income, how would that impact the, the deficit and the borrowing? That's, that's a great sort of two-part question because technically Social Security is off budget. And often when we talk about Social Security, we talk about it on its own basis because Social Security's got its own dedicated tax that goes into a trust fund that pays for its own benefits. But whenever I show numbers like this, whenever anybody does, they're looking at the unified budget deficit. And so that means this is including Social Security's deficit and it was previously including Social Security surpluses when it ran them. If we were to raise the cap, eliminate it without the, you know, a lot of people want to do a $400,000 donut hole because God forbid anyone making $398,000 pays a higher tax. But if we were just to eliminate it entirely without that donut hole, it would be about 200 billion a year. So instead of a, you know, so you could basically take all these numbers and subtract 200 billion. Now that's a lot, over 10 years, that's $2 trillion. Um, but it's not like that, it's not like it brings us to balanced budget. Uh, let me keep going. So deficits are what we add to the debt each year, pretty much, right? So they're the difference between how much we spend each year and how much we raise in, in revenue. Um, and we add that to the debt, right? So it's kind of like this would be um, your, your monthly credit card bill is your deficit, and then your credit card balance is your debt. Um, and so we keep accumulating debt year after year after year because we're never paying it down. In fact, when the debt comes due, we pay it by issuing new debt. So we roll it over. We're never paying it down. The last time we paid down any debt, other than on like a monthly basis, was in 2001. Um, we're rolling it over. And as a result, debt has gotten quite high. Uh, now, as an, as an economist, econo as a budget person, I prefer to look at debt not in dollar numbers. We hear a lot about like 36 trillion in debt or things like that, but it's a share of GDP. Why? Because this is one way to tell us how much debt we have relative to what we can afford. It's the same again as, you know, I think people can take the household metaphor too far, but there's some ways that it's, it's extremely apt. If you're um, uh, making $2 million a year and you have a $200,000 mortgage, you're in pretty good shape. But if you're making $20,000 a year and you have a $200,000 mortgage, you may be struggling. Same thing for the federal government. The bigger our GDP, the more debt we can afford. And so we, one way we like to measure debt is as a share of GDP. Uh, historically, debt's averaged about half the size of GDP, but it has gone up and down a lot. Historically, it used to go up during wars. We'd issue a bunch of debt during wars, and then we'd run balanced budgets and allow it to erode, even pay it back after the wars. Uh, in World War II, debt peaked at about 106% of GDP. That's the highest it's ever been. Uh, then we ran balanced budgets and it came down. Then we had sort of the, the, uh, the Reagan era Cold War buildup and tax cuts, it went up, and then it came back down. And then we had the Great Recession and it went up, and then it didn't come back down. It actually, after that ended, it kept going up. Then we had the COVID crisis and it went up again. And then it didn't come back down. The little coming back down you see is not actually debt coming down, it's actually that uh, GDP recovered, because this is relative to GDP, so like 2020 was a really bad year for GDP. But debt did not come back down at all, and in fact, it's continuing to rise. So we have debt today that is almost as large as the economy, that's approaching those record levels we set with World War II, except for the difference being, uh, it's not because of one-time borrowing for a global war, it's because of ongoing borrowing, and we have no plan to pay it back, back down. Um, now, how do we get here? 
there's a lot of ways to look at how we got here, but remember I mentioned the last time that we ran a surplus was 2001. Right? In 2001, we were running surpluses, and we were projected to run surpluses as far as the eye can see. In fact, we were on course to pay off our debt, and people were panicked. What are we going to do if we pay off our debt and there's no bonds in the global financial system? I, those people maybe never talked to a member of Congress, so they wouldn't have been so worried. Um, that was never really a serious risk that they would just, uh, Congress would let you know, money burn that hole in their pocket. But um, had we, debt, debt in 2001 was at about a third of the size of the economy, like 32% of GDP. Had we enacted no major legislative changes since then, or any legislative changes we had paid for, meaning you could do a tax cut, but you gotta do a tax increase elsewhere, or you gotta do a spending cut elsewhere. Had we done that, debt would have been paid off um, several years ago. Uh, this doesn't look at every piece of legislation, but this looks at all major legislation that's happened since 2001. And basically what we find looking at this major legislation, debt would have been paid off to 2022. Um, instead, it's almost 100% of GDP, and both parties share the blame. About 77% of GDP of the debt was legislation that passed on a bipartisan basis. Some of it had a lot more support from one party or another, but this is, this is legislation that had at least significant support from both parties. And the remaining 20% partisan basis, but pretty evenly between, between the parties. And it's come not just from tax cuts, not from spending increases, but from both. Um, again, we looked at the math and we basically said, we basically found without major tax cuts passed since 2001, debt would be 37% of GDP lower. Without major spending increases, it'd be 33% of GDP lower. And without responses to last two recessions, it'd be 28% of GDP lower, which basically means that those three categories of legislation explain the entirety of our debt. Without any of them, we would have no debt at all, um, right? So spending increases are the problem, tax cuts are the problem, Republicans are the problem, Democrats are the problem. The few independents that have been in Congress are part of the problem too. Um, because they've also voted for most of this, most of this stuff. Um, it's very easy to mud sling and blame, um, but I would just recommend slinging your mud everywhere because there's plenty of it to, to go around. And it's not just the things we did since 2001. It's also the things we allowed to happen, right? So a lot of the budget is on autopilot. Um, and so part of the issue with 2001, it wasn't just that we cut taxes and that we increased spending in some areas. It's that we didn't do anything to avoid automatic spending increases in other areas. So this is a different way to look at it. We looked at, in 2001, there was a surplus of about 1.2% of GDP. In 2023, there was a deficit of 6.3. So that's a 7.5% of GDP difference. Two thirds of that is because spending is higher. One third is because tax revenue is lower. Of that higher spending, it's mostly Social Security and healthcare. And that's not because there's been a ton of policies to expand Social Security and healthcare. There have been a few, but not, not much. It's because the baby boomers are entering retirement, those pr healthcare costs are rising, the cost of retirement is rising, and so those programs have become more expensive over time, um, and we've allowed them to continue to grow on autopilot. So all this is just context for what the next president, or the next administration is, is going to face, right? Um, we think we know the candidates. There's, um, there's technically four major candidates running for office, um, and I, know, I heard no labels is going to have another candidate, but um, probably either Joe Biden or Donald Trump are going to be the next president, borrowing, barring some significant uh, turn of events. Um, and whichever it is, whomever it is, in their next term is going to face debt that's either at or extremely close to record levels. They're going to face interest costs that are growing rapidly. They're going to face, at the end of 2025, major policy expirations that they have to deal with, and they're going to face looming trust fund insolvency. So let me go through each of these in a little more detail. Let's start with the debt. Um, remember I said debt right now is almost as large as the economy. It's projected to keep rising. It's projected within 10 years to reach 116% of GDP, which would be, that's under current law, which would be a new record, uh, never before reached in this country. And over the long run, uh, excuse me, and that assumes that they allow current law to stick, which means it assumes that there's a bunch of tax cuts that expire um, at the end of next year, including middle class tax cuts as well as tax cuts for, for the wealthy. They assume they don't extend any of them. It assumes that uh, they let discretionary appropriations 
shrink to a level that they agreed to in a budget deal that they all sort of winked and said, we're not actually going to follow this budget deal. Um, it, it assumes that the expansion of Obamacare that, um, that we put in effect a couple years ago goes away. And so if we relax those assumptions, instead of saying current law, we say, what if they just keep doing what they're doing? They keep doing what they're doing, debt is headed to 131% of GDP. That's not that much higher than 116, but if you look at the trajectory, you can see it's meaningfully different. Instead of debt rising kind of slowly but surely, you can see by the end here it's starting to rise really rapidly. Um, that especially becomes true over the long run, right? So the Congressional Budget Office tries to project out 30 years. In 30 years, they estimate under current law, debt will reach 174% of GDP. That would put us at Japan levels. Japan's really the only country that has been able to sustain debt at levels like that. And they also haven't had any economic growth in 25 years, so I'm not sure we should look to them as an example. But at least, like, there is an example of a country that has debt and isn't in total crisis. But if we take the keep doing what you're doing approach and we start to kind of revert to the mean, then debt really starts to explode. Uh, it, it, it would exceed, I'm not sure why this graph cuts, cuts off in 230, but you have to trust me to exceed 250% of GDP shortly after 2050. And the Congressional Budget Office stops estimating after that because um, they basically think you're in a debt spiral at that point and they, they're, they, they don't know how to deal with it with their model. So we would have debt realistically out of control, but if I could pretend it was still in control, it would be well above 300% of GDP. There's no historical experience. There's no international experience of anybody with debt at, at something approaching these levels. Uh, now, what's driving this relative today is the aging of the population and rising healthcare cost growth. Um, if we didn't have those two things, uh, Social Security and Medicare wouldn't grow as a share of the economy. Revenue would grow because taxes grow over time as we get richer. Um, discretionary spending would fall relative to the economy because, um, you know, when your economy doubles, you don't need twice as big a military, for example. So if we could freeze everybody demographically so nobody was aging and we could stop healthcare costs from growing faster in the economy, our debt would be under control. Um, those are the key drivers of what is, is bringing our debt out of control. You can kind of see that here. This is kind of the, uh, 30 year forward picture of, you can see kind of social security is growing some from 5% to 6%, it used to be 4%. Healthcare is growing more. Um, interest is growing a lot because we keep borrowing more than we're paying more interest on it. And everything else is kind of shrinking, right? Everything else just isn't that big a deal uh, relative to, um, now that doesn't mean that there's not tons of money we can save in the defense budget or tons of money we could save from um, you know, food stamps or name your program. It doesn't mean that uh, there's not efficiencies to be had, but they're not, they're not growing rapidly. Um, they're not really growing at all relative to the economy. The growth is coming from our health programs, our retirement programs, and interest on the debt. Uh, just to give you another sense, here's what revenue looks like. Like we think revenue is going to kind of stabilize off, but this assumes again um, that these tax cuts expire, um, which my guess is they will not. President Biden, his budget today said he wants to extend all of them for everybody making below $400,000 a year. That happens to be 95% of the population. That's cheaper than extending it for 100% of the population, but, um, but still quite expensive. So if you look at that as kind of our, and he says he wants to pay for it, but didn't put in a budget where literally the job is to put pay fors out, he didn't include pay fors. So that's not an encouraging sign either. So bottom line is, Probably our revenue estimates are too optimistic, at least relative to where, where, where they're headed. And now consequences, that's what we're asking about. Why, why should we care about the fact that the next president is, is facing higher debt? One reason, which as you mentioned, is, is inflation. When you see a big change, this isn't really debt so much, debt came out of it, this is really deficits. When deficits have a big change year over year, it can lead to inflation. It can lead to a situation where you basically have too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, this is. Not all of, but this was a key part of what, prob what likely happened uh, after the COVID crisis, right? We, we all kind of were locked in our homes uh, for a year. Um, meanwhile, the federal government wasn't just keeping households whole, um, but was actually, um, you know, personal income went up 10% in 2020. Like, you wouldn't picture that. Norm you would think, like, this is the worst recession in our lifetimes, and income went up 10%, when typically it goes up 4% in a normal year. It went up another 10% in 2021, right? So people have tons of cash. They 
Also, an additional savings because they weren't going to restaurants, they weren't going on vacations, they weren't having their work commute, so they had even more cash. Um, if you owned a home, if you owned a stock portfolio, if you owned anything that was an asset, if you you know owned Bitcoin or whatever, anything, its value went up. So you felt there's that extra wealth. And then all of a sudden things reopened. And so people went out to spend that money, right? They went out to spend it fast. And we didn't have the productive capacity to meet it. In part, we didn't have the productive capacity because we were still down 10 million jobs. Um, you know, we were still down 10 million jobs when kind of the reopening started. And you can't create 10 million jobs in a month. So part of it was just a timing thing. But part of it was this huge amount of money that we deficit financed um, that people went out and spent. And that disconnect between supply and demand caused a surge in inflation um, or was a factor in the surge in, in, in inflation along with continued supply constraints. Uh, there's, there's other theories of why debt may further cause inflation about related to expectations and the uh, price value of money theory like that. I can talk about that more. But the bottom line is um, excessive borrowing, especially when it's rapid, can cause high inflation. That raises the cost of living for everything, right? So I took a few um, sort of items that, that, not at random, but I selected a few things. Used car prices today are 45% higher than they were prior to the pandemic. Rent, average rent is 22% higher. Gasoline, 37% higher. Milk, 38% higher. Now, all these are official data. Um, this last one is original research. That's the Zingerman's Rubin, um, so, which I had today. And it was uh, delicious, but it cost $20.99, which compared to 2019 is a 24% uh, increase. Right, so inflation can hit you where it hurts. Not not just things nobody cares about because I use cars, but like the Zingerman sandwich, also affected by inflation. It's really broad across the board. Every part of uh, the economy experienced this inflation, and that means, um, particularly if you're on a fixed income, um, there's a lot of pain. If you're on a salary, you may be lucky enough that your wages on a lag caught up to that inflation, um, but nonetheless, you still have that inflation. That's one reason you should worry. Another reason you should worry is interest rates. Right, so. Luckily, inflation is coming down. We had two years, it was about 6 or 7%. Last year, it was 3%. This year, maybe it'll be 2.5%. We're aiming for 2, so we're still elevated, but it's coming down. But it's being replaced with high interest rates. Uh, government treasuries uh, are paying, I don't know what it is today. This, is a, this graph's a couple weeks old, and they change rapidly. But they're paying between 4 and 5 and 5.5%. Whereas if you kind of look back to the last 15 years, the, the three-month has been you know, at zero for most of, for most of it. Um, and the 10 year's been at, you know, 3%, 2%. So rates of government bonds are high, but that translates into mortgage rates. Mortgage rates are 7% now compared to, you know, people were locking them in at 3% not too long ago. Car loans are expensive. Uh, it's harder to, to buy a washer dryer on installment plans and often you've got to pay interest rate on that credit card interest. So this interest costs hit everybody, right? And there's a really good amount of, of academic literature that kind of backs up the theory. The theory is, is this idea called crowd out. Um, the easiest way that I explain it is when the government sells bonds, somebody's buying that bond instead of investing in the private sector. And that means there's less investment in the private sector. But the mechanism through that, which that usually happens is higher interest rates. They have to offer higher interest rates in order to attract people away from those private sector investments. And there's pretty good literature that like for every 10% of GDP increase in debt, interest rates go up a quarter point. It's not, that's not exactly true. That's kind of an average of a bunch of different studies over different periods of time. But the link is pretty well established. And so more debt means higher interest rates you're paying on everything. Uh, it also means slower economic growth. And this is one of those things, again, it's the, the frog in the boiling water. right? If you throw a bog in the frog in boiling water, they'll jump out. But if you start to boil it, they won't notice. Right? We're not going to notice these things, except we're looking backwards. But what, you know, what the theory tells us and what the evidence backs up is that the more debt, the less economic growth we have over time because of that same crowd out reason. People are putting more money to government bonds. They're investing less into the private sector, which means they're buying less stocks and so there's going to be less issuance. Or they're putting less money in the bank, which it can then loan out for mortgages or for small businesses or other things like that. And over time, that eats its way into income growth. These are estimates from the Congressional Budget Office 30 years out, right? Because it's a gradual cumulative thing. But basically, they think that 30 years out, on our current trend, if debt basically stopped growing, uh, average income per person would be about $125,000 in today's dollars. That's average, it's not median. But trust me that they don't run the median, but you can trust me that the differential would be similar. Um, they think that if we continue on our current law path, 
it'll be 116,000. And if we continue on that hockey stick path I showed you before for debt, it'll be 110,000. And so what that basically means is that with a fast, rapidly growing debt scenario, income will grow a third slower. It only grows two thirds as fast, right? 30,000 instead of 45,000 as with no more debt as a share of the economy, stable debt. Uh, that's really meaningful. It's not meaningful that you feel from year to year, right? So I was gonna have a 2% wage increase and instead I have a 1.6% wage increase. 0.4%, that's not that big a deal. But if every year you were gonna get a 2% increase and instead you have a 1.6% increase, that starts to matter, it starts to matter a lot. But is this, is these, is the variation across these scenarios coming from some sort of exogenous fluctuation in the debt, or is it that there's actual cuts that households experience as losses of benefits? Like, I might be willing to forego my higher income right. if I knew I had Social Security and Medicare, for example. So how does that fit in here? Great, great question. Let me, let me tell you, like, the technical answer and then, like, the philosophical answer. The technical answer is the difference between the first two scenarios is essentially completely exogenous because the difference is CBO ran it once by saying, what if we assumed debt had no crowd out effect? And then they ran it a second way and said, okay, now what do we see in our model? Between the second one and the third one is actually specific policies. And the, the major policies are significantly lower, how they incorporate them are significantly lower tax rates on capital and labor, which is sort of reflective of, um, it's complicated how they do it, but it's basically reflective of it extends the Trump tax cuts and then don't let real bracket creep happen after that. Um, and it's increases in discretionary spending of which they assume a certain amount is, um, is investments. And so that's the technical answer to your question is that essentially between the first and the second, it's, it's sort of, it, it's fairy dust and between the second and the third is actual policies. I think the philosophical point you're making is that like we need to compare the economic cost of debt to the economic benefit of what we're buying with that debt. And not just the GDP benefit, but the, but the benefit that may appear um, in, in transfer payments, for example, or in lower taxes, or in having more security because we know that the Department of Defense is more likely to protect us or things like that. And that is the trade-off. That's, that's always the, that's always the trade-off between borrowing and not borrowing. Oh wait, I think we need a microphone. Sorry. Tax rates, I mean, you, you've talked several of your present slide presentations about it. Is the, is the tax rate on individual and corporate income realistic? I mean, uh, I used to live in Massachusetts, and uh, the state last year enacted a millionaire's tax, uh, a minimum tax on incomes over, I don't recall now exactly what it was because their analysis showed that to people paying income tax in Massachusetts, due to all the deductions and so forth, that the wealthier people could take whatever the stated rate was, the actual rate they were paying was substantially lower and contributing to the state's deficit. Is that, would that hold true for the federal government as well? And how would that impact your analysis? Yeah. Nobody's paying 37% of their income in taxes is the answer. Um, in, in income taxes, right? That's the top rate. Nobody's paying 37% of their income in income taxes because 37 is your top rate, but you're paying some money at the lower rates. You're deducting, if you're wealthy enough to make, to be in the 37% rate, you're deducting $10,000 of state and local taxes. You're deducting your mortgage interest. You're deducting your charitable giving. Um, you probably have tax-free bonds. You have a bunch of money in capital gains that's paying a lower rate that can be 23.8. Uh, you, um, maybe are a pass-through business owner of some kind, and so you're getting a 20% deduction, and you're taking losses, most of which are actual losses, but some of which maybe are, you're fudging a little bit because your company car you're also using for individual purposes. Uh, your health care isn't subject to tax. The bottom line is nobody's paying the top rate. There's a, we have a, um, I wouldn't say a narrow base, but we've kind of a Swiss cheese tax base, right, um, where there are, um, a lot of ways to reduce your rate relative to the taxable rate. That's all included in this analysis. And the other piece of it um, is a lot of people aren't paying all the taxes that they owe. In fact, I'll get to that in a few, in a, in a few charts. But um, what that suggests is there's actually a lot more room to raise revenue without having to kind of, first of all, without raising taxes, just by collecting the taxes that are owed. But secondly, without having to raise rates or without having to 
even explicitly cut tax breaks that are intended under the law because they're because you can start by kind of going after the compliance and the workarounds and the loopholes, and then you go to the tax breaks, and then you look at the rates. It's one way to think about it. But uh, we have a very broad base that leaves a lot of opportunity to av avoid taxation, some of it by intent, some of it um, sort of just has just happened over time. So many other consequences to the debt, kind of slower economic growth. Uh, there's, you mentioned kind of foreign owners of debt um, there. That's declined over time, actually, but there's, there's still risks associated. There's risk and benefits associated with foreigners owning our debt. The benefit is we don't get as much of the crowd out. We still basically get the economic growth because we're not taking it out of domestic investors. The downside is we don't get the returns to that growth. Returns to that growth actually go abroad. The other downside is um, when there's major geopolitical tensions, it could become a tool um, you know, to be used for, for better or for worse. We have rising interest payments, which I'll get into um, a little bit in a minute. Less fiscal space. There's a lot of research on this, basically. Countries that add, enter recessions with very high levels of debt don't respond to them as well. It's partially a political constraint, partially a market constraint, but there's at least the perception among policymakers that debt is too high already, so we can't borrow more even if we need to borrow. Um, and, and so that, you know, we saw in the Great Recession, low debt countries did a lot better coming out of it than high debt countries. Um, there's, you know, the budget becomes more stagnated and stuck, and so there's less room to, to make changes. And then the one that, you know, is unlikely, but it's kind of the crisis scenario, is that debt gets so high, we create a financial crisis. The, the scenario here, look, um, we're never going to default on our debt. We print in our own currency, so we don't have to default on our debt. There's, the only way we default on our debt is if Congress does something stupid, like not raise the debt limit. Um, we are also the strongest economy in the history of the known universe, right? And so for those reasons, we don't face solvency crises. Um, but we could face a situation where um, our debt is rising at such a rapid clip uh, that the markets start to panic, that we're not going to ever be able to bring it back down, and that our only two choices will be that there's some percent chance that our only two choices will be to default on the debt intentionally or to inflate our way out of it. And then they may demand higher interest rates. And that may cause the 14 trillion of bonds around the, the world that are currently back in the global financial system, the ones that aren't held by the Fed or, uh, or elsewhere, to, to lose substantial value. And that'll cause a banking crisis, right? So think of the Silicon Valley banking crisis as kind of a little microcosm of, of that. Um, they were putting a lot of their assets in, in bonds, and the value went down because the interest rate went up, and they went insolvent. Um, if interest rates went up a lot, not just a, you know, not just a point, they went up rapidly, that could happen broadly. We could have a financial crisis. I put this as a low-risk scenario, but it's a scenario that that low risk increases as your debt does. And then I mentioned before, but I want to kind of pull this separately because it's a separate challenge, at least in the, in the paper, how we wrote the paper. Um, the next president is going to face growing interest costs. And we're actually already seeing this. Interest on the debt this year will be the second largest government program. Um, it was the fourth two years ago. Uh, it is this year going to exceed the defense budget. This year is going to exceed the Medicare budget. So we're going to spend more on interest than we spend on defending our country. Last year, we spent more on interest than we spent total on children at the federal level. Right? Add together all federal spending on children, K-12 through education, child tax credit, um, children's nutrition, children's health care, children's share of Social Security for their dependent benefits. Like We counted everything, even programs that aren't for kids. Um, we were spending more in interest than those. We were spending more servicing the past than investing in the future. Um, and on our current trajectory, interest will become the largest government program within a quarter century. That's where we're headed. Um, it is crowding out everything else, is exceeding everything else. Uh, it is approaching a new record as a share of the economy. When this happened in the 90s, it was a major impetus for deficit reduction because there really was a panic that, like, why is our biggest line item, we're paying interest on the debt? Our biggest line item should be we're protecting the country, we're investing in the future, we're providing health care. Pick your thing that you care about. It shouldn't be, you know, we're paying for tax cuts that happened 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, as I mentioned before, interest is now past children. And there's no looking back. Um, we're, we are past, really past the point of return unless we have a huge increase in investment in children combined with um, significant reduction in debt. 
or interest rates really collapse. Um, but if interest rates collapse, there may be something else very bad happening in the economy, so I'm not sure we should wish for, wish for that one. We now spend more service in the past than investing in the future. Um, and where this really gets to be potentially troubling is if it leads debt sustainability out of control. Um, for the last 15 years, we've benefited from the fact that the economy grew faster than the interest rate. And this is kind of like in, in uh, finance literature, this is really important because when you're looking at your past debt, there's sort of two things that are happening to it over time. One is it keeps growing with interest, but the other is it keeps eroding relative to your economy. Because remember what I said is debt to GDP matters. And as long as that erosion is happening faster than that growth, all you gotta worry about is your new debt. Now that new debt's still problematic, but like at least you can say at some point we could, Congress maybe will stop. At some point Congress can stop. And we're just aware of the past debt. But, and in fact, mathematically, if Congress keeps borrowing at the same level for kind of new deficits, and your growth rate is above your interest rates, your debt will stabilize at some level. So for example, sorry, this is just the last 15 years showing it low. So for example, uh, if your Congress was borrowing 3% of GDP a year for non-interest, just they were spending 3% more of GDP on fun stuff than we're raising in taxes, and your interest rate was 1% below your growth rate, your debt would stabilize at three over one, which is 300% of GDP. That's a lot of debt. You know, like that would put us at historically uncharted territory. So I'm not saying we should go there, but like you at least would know that eventually, mathematically, it should stabilize. Uh, this is sort of a similar situation with 2% of primary deficit, it would be 200% of GDP. Um, but the risk is when your interest rate is above the growth rate, which is now on new debt, new, new interest rates are four to five and a half percent, our growth rate's about 4%, then your debt can grow forever with no end in sight. And when that can get especially scary is when you think about the dynamics effects because remember more debt pushes up interest rates and it pushes down the growth rate. And so this kind of assumes the growth rate and the interest rate are fixed, but we know that more debt means higher interest and lower growth. And so that can lead to this, um, Oh, sorry, my clicker's backwards. That can lead to this sustainability scenario. So when your interest rates are high, you have this sort of risk on the horizon that you go from debt that seems like it's rising rapidly to debt that's rising uncontrollably. Um, this is not a projection of where we'll be. This is sort of an illustration to show what can happen if your debt spins out of control. Um, the next, so the next president's gonna face those interest costs. They're gonna face that debt. They also have a bunch of like legislative deadlines that they have to face that are really important. In January, the debt limit comes back. We have to raise the debt limit or we default. Um, sometime, there's all sorts of tricks we can play to extend the deadline, but probably sometime in the summer, maybe in the fall, we'll have to raise it. We, the last time, we raised it with a budget deal. We agreed to a budget deal that would set discretionary levels for this year and next. That budget deal expires. So we either have to renew it or come up with something new by October. Then the big one is at the end of the year. We passed a ton of tax cuts in 2017. Corporate individual. Most of the corporate ones were permanent. Not all of them, but most of them are permanent. Most of the individual ones were set to expire in 2025. Um, there's a couple reasons for that, but one was that I think they thought the political pressure to extend the individual ones would be a lot stronger than the political pressure to extend the corporate ones. Um, so if we do nothing, tax rates go up for everyone. Every tax rate goes up. The top tax rate, the bottom rate, the middle rates. The child tax credit goes from 2,000 per child to 1,000 per child. The standard deduction drops in half. The alternative minimum tax comes back, which is a, was a very confusing tax we mostly got rid of. The salt cap disappears. That's something some people might like. Um, and some corporate provisions change as well. And then on top of that, um, we expanded Obamacare recently. Those expansions go away. So there's a lot that's gonna happen at the end of December. Um, and there's big fiscal implications, right? So depending on what we do with these caps, um, spending could be significantly lower, significantly higher. Um, if we were to extend basically everything that expires as is from the tax cuts and the health care bills, we would add $4 trillion to that, $4 trillion on top of what we're already scheduled to borrow. The president said he only wants to extend below 400000 That could still easily be $3 trillion. Um, if he does it the way, you know, I want him to do it, it would be two trillion. If he does it the way that uh, Chuck Schumer wants to do it, it may actually be four and a half trillion because um, he may not want to extend 
the, the 2017 tax bill had tax increases and tax cuts. The tax cuts were just bigger. He may want to not extend any of the tax increase part of it, any of the pay-fors. So this is a very expensive decision point, and there's going to be a lot of disagreement among the members, and somebody's got to solve it. Um, we got a model where you can kind of choose every option. In two weeks, we're going to release a more online version of it. Um, but you can kind of play around with the parameters, and you can see uh, you can do this in a way that doesn't cost money. But it's not easy. You've got to make some tough choices. You've got to have some of those rates be higher, make some of the tax breaks stricter, things like that, things that they, politicians don't like to do, right? Things that a tax economists love to do, but politicians don't like to do. Uh, and then on top of that, there's looming insolvency of these major trust fund, major trust fund programs. Um, remember, we're getting older as a society. The number of 65-year-olds is growing, but the number of 85-year-olds is also growing. Um, this means fewer people paying into these programs, or actually the same number of people paying into these programs, no growth in people paying into them, but a lot more people collecting benefits from Social Security and Medicare. Um, there are 10,000 Americans born every day. Anyone want to guess how many Americans are turning 65 every day? Also 10,000. Okay, so essentially, the only growth we have in our population right now is immigration and for people living longer. Otherwise, there's no growth in the population. The population is basically frozen, but for those two factors. People living longer is wonderful, but not helpful for the budget, right? Um, um, and immigrants um, are, are, can be very helpful for the budget and the economy, but the problem with them is they also get old, like the rest of us, right? So that buys us time, but it doesn't change the underlying structures of the demographics. So we have a problem that we're getting much older as a society. Um, and yet we have major programs that are kind of built to be self-contained where we pay in based on wages and then we get out the benefits, Social Security being the biggest one. Um, as recently as 2009, workers were actually paying more into Social Security than we were paying out in benefits. And so we were running surpluses. And we put those surpluses in a trust fund. But since 2010, we've been pulling out of that trust fund, pulling out the interest of the trust fund. And the gap between spending and revenue is getting larger and larger. And it's projected by 2033, that trust fund will run out. Social Security will run out of reserves. Maybe it'll be 2032, maybe it'll be 2034. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but we have a pretty good idea of how old the population is going to be in nine years because, you know, you can't birth a 10-year-old um, or a 12-year-old. And so even if birth rates go up a lot tomorrow, they're not going to be contributing anything in taxes. Nine-year-olds barely pay any taxes, unfortunately. Um, so this is kind of pre-baked, right? In nine years, Social Security runs out. This is co we've got countdown clocks to make it extra scary um, for these programs because it's not just Social Security. It's also Medicare hospital insurance. It's also the Highway Trust Fund. Highway Trust Fund's running out of four years. Medicare, seven years. Social Security in nine years and change. When it runs out, that does not mean Social Security ends um, for a lot of reasons, one being Congress wouldn't let it end, but the other being that's not what the law says. But what the law says is it can't pay more than it's bringing in a revenue. And effectively, that would mean a 23% by our current estimates across the board benefit cut, 23%. Doesn't matter if you're 62 years old or 102 years old. Doesn't matter if you're rich, poor. Um, everybody gets this cut. For a typical couple that retires in nine years, and when you think about nine years away, that means that um, if they're retiring at the normal age, that means they're 58 now, right? 58-year-olds. So it's not like I used to give these talks, and we used to say, we got to save this for our kids. Um, we got to save it for our grandkids, but it's actually your grandparents we got to save it for, right? A 58-year-old is going to turn 67 in 2033. At that point, they're a typical, if they're an average earning couple, their benefits under the law would be cut $17,400 for, for a dual-earning dual earning typical couple, $17,400. That's the cost of doing nothing. Now, we're not going to do nothing, but it matters the something we do. The something we do can be to say, we're going to abandon Social Security as we know it as a self finance program, and we're just going to borrow the money. That's one option. The something could be we're going to have abrupt tax increases or abrupt benefit cuts or some combination. The something could be we're going to keep fighting and we're going to accidentally go off the cliff. That's possible. Congress has done that before. Um, so I'm telling you this is not going to happen, and it's probably not going to happen, but like, it could happen from incompetence. Um, it could happen from political dysfunction. Even if it doesn't happen, the alternative um, could be similarly disruptive. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, I heard that, like, not to label generations, but Generation X was population was smaller 
than the population coming up. So how does that affect yeah. the solvency? So basically, here's what's happened. Um, the baby boomers are a huge generation. They're larger than the generation before because they're kind of compressed because everyone came home from war. But, and so we talk about this as the big thing that's happening is the baby boomers are retiring. But really, the baby boomers, baby boomers retiring is the beginning of a total change in the birth rate. Every generation subject to the, every generation subsequent to the baby boomers had about two kids per couple, give or take. They've not all been exactly the same size. They've gone up and down a little bit. They seem like it's down now, but some of it may be people having kids later. But give or take, we used to have three to four kids per couple. Now we have two. And so the baby boomers are sort of just the beginning of a permanent change in demographics, where we were permanently older as a society. And as a result, uh, we will permanently have basically about um, half as many seniors as we do everybody else, which means that sort of as we do workers. So which means that basically, or as we do working age adults. And so basically every two adults needs to take care of one seniors, whereas right now it's close to three and it used to be five. <clears throat> I want to say I'm, uh, there's like a lot of ways to fix this, right? So, you know, saving Social Security could mean raising a bunch of taxes. Um, currently, people only pay payroll taxes in the first hundred and seventy some thousand dollars of income. We could eliminate that cap or um, eliminate it with a donut hole or raise it or whatever. That wouldn't fix the problem, but that would get us a lot of the way there. We could supplement that by, say, raising the payroll tax rate. That's what basically what this top plan did, Social Security 2100. It got rid of that cap, but then it gradually raised the tax rate by like two and a half points. And the combination of those things saved it. <coughs> we could fix this all on the benefit side. Um, you know, cut benefits or slow their growth. You can do it mainly for higher earners. Right now, the richer you are, the more you get in Social Security benefits. So you can cut benefits for higher earners and still still be doing better than low earners because it's sort of based on your wages. Um, we, you can gradually raise the retirement age. Uh, people are living longer. It turns out there's actually a lot of benefits to working longer. I mean, the literature isn't definitive, but I think it's pretty clear that on average when people work a little bit long, not when they work like 10 years longer, but when they delay their retirement by a year or two, um, what we see is they, they tend to live longer as a result. They're physically healthier, mentally healthier, stronger social networks lower divorce rates because they're not at home annoying their spouse all day, like all sorts of benefits to working longer. Um, so like you could raise the retirement age, you could change the inflation formula, there's lots of things you could do. You do it all on that side and solve it that way. I think given how close we are to the deadline, we're probably gonna do some kind of combination approach, which is kind of reflected in that middle plan, but that's, you know, there's, there's lots of options. The, the issue is the closer you get to the deadline, the fewer options you have. So what do we need from the next president? Right? The next president's gonna face debt approaching or at record levels, interest costs surging, all these major expirations, and these trust funds that are approaching insolvency. Um, if all they wanna do is hold the debt to 100% of GDP, which basically means stabilize it at where it'll probably be when they take office, um, they need $6 trillion in net deficit reduction. President Biden released his budget today, he had three trillion, so he'd be halfway there. Um, but they need six trillion. If you want to do something like balance the budget, not, not in the first year, but after 10 years, you need 16 trillion. That's a lot, that's not gonna happen. Um, six trillion is hard enough. 16 trillion is not gonna happen. It's basically would be like cutting all spending by a quarter. And they've been saying, um, oh yeah, this is my next slide, so that's perfect. Um, part of achieving the six trillion, I think involves leaving as much optionality as possible. So that's been concerning me a lot is a candidate will say, yeah, I wanna fix the debt, I wanna cut spending, but we can't touch Social Security, we can't touch Medicare, we can't touch vet veterans, and we, don't, and we can't touch defense. Those are like three of the four biggest government programs, sorry, four of the five biggest government programs. Um, if you want to balance the budget by all spending, you already have to cut it by a ridiculous 25%. But if you exempt Defense, veterans, Medicare, and Social Security, you have to cut it by 76%, right? Like, essentially, you gotta eliminate the rest of government. That's not happening. Similarly, you know, we hear, we need more revenue. The problem is taxes are too low. But <clears throat> we can't raise taxes by a dime on anybody making less than $400,000, even if it's cutting a tax break that we agree, is a, we agree is egregious, right? Like, maybe, has anyone heard of like the carried interest tax break? It's like the most, people like to talk about this all the time. It's like a hedge fund tax break. 
in President Biden, not to pick on President Biden, but I'm going to for a second, because, um, by the way, that last one was Trump that says don't touch Social Security, Medicare, um, veterans in defense. That's Trump. But President Biden has said, we're going to close this terrible carried interest loophole, which is a huge loophole that lets hedge fund, hedge fund people basically cheat on their taxes. But if that hedge fund person only makes $399,000 a year, they get to keep that loophole. What kind of sense does that make? That's ridiculous, right? If it's a loop, if such an egregious loophole, I think somebody in the 97th percent of the income spectrum can afford to not have it anymore. But those kind of pledges make solving this really hard. If you were to try to balance the budget again, that's not where we're going. We just want to give you a sense of magnitude. By raising taxes, you have to raise all taxes by 30 percent. But if you want to do it just on people making over 400,000 in corporations, you have to raise it by 74 percent. That's Probably not actually even possible because if you raise, start to raise taxes that high, um, you get more tax avoidance. You get people working less, investing less. Um, you know, like some people like to say, like cutting taxes pays for themselves. That's ridiculous. But there is a point that that's true. At some point, you know, if you cut the tax rate from 100 percent to 99 percent, it would pay for itself because who wants to work and get no money? But if you get some money, it might work, right? So, at raising all taxes, maybe above 75 percent you're probably on the wrong side of, of that situation, or you're at least close enough to it, you're not going to get the revenue. So it's probably literally impossible. Probably about as impossible as cutting spending by 75%. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, we don't know what the candidates are going to propose yet because their campaign websites are disappointingly naked. But we know what they've done. Um, when President Trump was in office, he added... Last time, he added $8 trillion to the debt. Half of this was COVID, but half of it was before COVID. It was tax cuts. It was spending increases. By the way, three quarters of this was bipartisan, so it wasn't Trump by himself. It was Trump mostly with congressional Democrats and congressional Republicans adding $8 trillion to the debt. Uh, President Biden, you know, uh, I guess he, he, he wins by setting the bar very low. He only added $4 trillion to the debt. Um, and again, about half of it was um, covid Although I think that it was COVID at a time that a lot of people were telling him we didn't need that much COVID relief. So, um, and again, a lot of it was bipartisan. Uh, basically, all the non-COVID stuff, or most of it, was by was bipartisan. That's even with deficit reduction. President Biden has signed a couple large deficit reduction bills into law. Even with those deficit reduction bills, we're still at four trillion net added to the debt. <clears throat> so I'm gonna. just lastly kind of list to you kind of what we've kind of called for in the campaign, and then I want to want to turn to questions, which is, um, you know, we just put out these principles, and they're a little bit cheesy, but we think campaigns are a little bit cheesy when they're at their best. Um, but uh, we think they ought to be honest about the fiscal situation, make deficit reduction a top priority, put forward proposals to pay for new initiatives and, and pay off the debt, um, not take things off the table, deal with the trust funds, deal with the major expirations, and use honest numbers. Like, we understand that they don't have budgeting offices. I mean, President Biden does. Um, but we understand that it's hard to have great estimates for stuff. But use, use the best estimates you can. Um, don't take advantage of the fact that you don't have a scorekeeper to make stuff up, which happens a lot on these campaigns. And a major part of what we're trying to do in U.S. Budget Watch is to push back on that by putting real numbers and real estimates to their policies. So at this point, I'd love to take, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> so it seems like um, many of the things that would write the fiscal ship are unlikely enough to happen that you don't have to address this question. But um, my question would hypothetically be, clearly the level of the deficit and debt are too high, but the right number is not zero, right? So yeah. how do you decide? Like if, if you were in this scenario where like all these things happened, at what, mo what would it would be make you be like, okay, wait, that's enough actually? Yeah, that's a great question. So I kind of look, all right, and it's so hypothetical because here's, here's the truth that I hope doesn't get wide street webcast to too far, is that like, I would like the debt to stop growing, but because the United States is, has such a strong economy, if we can just get it to grow more slowly, we probably are going to be okay. That doesn't mean we're going to be great. We're probably going to be okay. Um, what 
I kind of look at this as, I'm not going to give you a number because there's no magic number, but I kind of look at two different goals with different kinds of trade-offs involved. The first goal is to achieve debt sustainability. And what I mean by that is basically, I want the debt that is declining, not rising as a share of GDP, and that I have reason, reason, I have reasonable cause to believe that it's not going to start rising again. And it could be barely declining, but like I want to know that like we're in the right direction, and so we're not at risk of some kind of death spiral with a hockey stick. And for that, I think we're going to make some sacrifices of policies that we really don't like, um, because um, even though the risk of a fiscal crisis is low, the cost of it is incredibly high, so we want to avoid it. And then I look at a second of like sort of debt optimization. And so once we have a sustainable debt, then I think every policy you look at more in more traditional trade-offs, right? Because we know that lower debt helps lower interest rates, helps grow the economy. So once we're at sustainable, then I think you really do take it one off and you say, okay, um, we could raise those ta- this, this particular tax and that would be good for the debt and good for the economy, but it'd be bad for the people paying the taxes and bad because it causes this distortion. Or we could cut this particular spending program. And so I kind of, I'd, like to, I'd love to get back to the world of traditional trade-offs which I think is hard to do when you have an unsustainable debt. So my first step is sustainability. And then after that, it's got to be policy by policy because some policies have really high returns and some don't. And then at some point, sorry, it would get so low that there would actually be a danger of having you sort of the benefits of lowering the debt more would be negative. I just, I so wish that we could have that conversation and I could be up here telling you that our debt is too low. Um, but I, I don't think that now we're not just like at the moon. Now we're at like Alpha Centauri or something. Hi, my name is Shane Baum. Um, I'm a reporter with the Michigan Daily. Um, why is it important to stay informed about candidates' policies regarding fiscal challenges um, in programs like Social Security, Medicare? And then why would you, uh, why would some people ignore these problems? Well, Medicare insolvency is six years away. Social Security insolvency is nine years away. Um, that means that we're going to deal with it within the next two presidential administrations or so. Um, and if we're smart, we will deal with it in the next presidential administration. I think you should care what your candidate thinks they're going to do to solve this or to ignore it. Um, and what's disappointed me so far is the degree to which candidates want to stick their heads in the sand and ignore it. Uh, Hello, my name is Ben Farber. I'm also with the Michigan Daily. Um, uh, So my question is, like, how literate uh, uh, are the average voters currently about the fiscal challenges facing the federal budget? And do you think uh, that the level of literacy from voters affects what each candidate decides to do? I'm more worried about the level of literacy of the candidates than of the voters. Um, I think voters understand... I think voters understand generally the situation. I don't think they understand the specifics. I think Americans get a lot of things wrong. They think foreign aid is way bigger than it is. They um, don't understand the details of how the Social Security Trust Fund interacts with the general fund. But like, I don't think the voters need to understand at that level. Um, I think the voters understand there's a problem. I think they understand there's a relationship between borrowing and inflation and interest rates and economic risk. And I think they want candidates that are going to fix it. Um, but political candidates uh, like to make promises they can't keep, and I think that's the much bigger problem. Um, this is like on topic, but off topic. I've heard a lot about uh, the U.S. dollar is apparently not backed by any commodity. Um, how does that impact like our economics if our dollar is not backed by gold or yeah. something like that? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really aware of any. Um, currencies that are still commodity backed. It's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, and it works because we all believe it works. And um, I guess that all could come crashing down, but so far it's been a far superior economic system to one that's backed by a commodity because it allows us flexibility with the money supply. And that means that when there's recessions or when there's inflation problems, we have solutions. Whereas when you're stuck being backed by gold, um, you're you're, there, there's not really that same kind of way out. <clears throat> uh, 
I don't hear. I mean, I hear you, but I don't hear you through the mic, I don't think. Okay. It is. It says it's on. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is kind of a follow up to the other question you talked about just a minute ago is, you know, we wish our candidates had more literacy or were more willing to acknowledge what's going on. And, you know, we wish everyone was more educated and was just willing to do the right thing. In the absence of that, I know your organization has done a lot of work on sort of structural procedural recommendations. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about kind of what does the budget process look like right yeah. now? What sort of things are fundamentally broken? And how could we put those structures in place to give people the incentives to do the right things? Yeah, that's a good question. To me, the budget process is broken because the norms surrounding it are broken. The way it's supposed to work and the way it used to work is Congress comes together and they write a budget. And that budget was their actual plan for what they wanted to do over the Congress. And after it was passed, they tried to do that plan. They didn't always succeed in doing it. They often changed the plan midway, but they always tried to do that plan. And that was really important. That was, in some years, they got pretty damn close to almost exactly that plan. In other years, they got nothing done. But like, that was the North Star. Since, and I don't know the exact year that it's broken down, you could say it was 1998 or 2005 or 2010. It's not exactly clear because it happened so gradually. But at some point, the budget instead became one of two things. A political document with make-believe numbers to just say, you know, we're balancing the budget or whatever. Or a way to shortchange the process because the budget has special rules that allow you to implement some policies faster and basically avoid the filibuster. And so sometimes they pass budgets that don't actually have any budget in it, they just have the fast track rules. Uh, I, I, th that's not sustainable to me um, because you start, you can't budget without a budget. Um, I don't know how to say it other than that, you can't budget without a budget and effectively that's what we've been trying to do and so we're going from leadership deal to leadership deal and crisis to crisis and we're trying to solve everything you know, by threatening the full faith of credit in the U.S. Uh, dollar on the debt limit, which we shouldn't do, but also there seems like there's no alternative to talk about the debt besides the debt limit. So we're in a bad place now. Now, I know you wanted me to tell you, like, how we can get out of this bad place, and I wish I had great ideas. We have a lot of ideas, um, but the ideas are, are things like changing the way we report the budget and changing some of the rules around um, how easy or hard it is to add to the deficit. They don't replace the need to like actually abide by the rules. And I don't know how to force politicians to abide by the rules other than to reinforce those, those norms. And I'm a little stuck in how we reinforce norms that are so far gone. Sorry, that was really depressing. Someone asked me a happy question. I, I'm thinking back to the one slide you showed. If, if social, if the, if the Social Security and Medicare trust funds being exhausted is the primary <clears throat> driver, why isn't removing the cap on taxes to support those funds the solution? I think it is a part of the solution. Um, are you saying like, why don't I think it's the solution or why doesn't Congress do it? No, I'm just saying on that one graph you put back, showed up, uh, what would happen if- Which graph am I, are we talking about? No. This one? No, further back, I guess. There was one where you showed the top line on the assumption that the taxes on the tax limit on earnings that was taxed to support Medicare and Social Security if it was removed. And it basically, as I remember the slide, it looked like it erased the problem. Oh, I see. Hold on. I know which one you're talking about. So let me see if I can find. So first of all, there is no limit on Medicare. In fact, not only have we gotten rid of the limit, we got rid of it in 1993, we also now have an extra 0.9% surtax. So Medicare is actually the opposite situation. It's not only that there's no cap, you actually pay more at the top. So it's only Social Security where this is an issue. Hold on, I think I know which slide we're ta you're talking about. We just gotta get there. Um, this one. So this, um, This blue line, this blue dotted line at the top, um, assumes two things happen on revenue. The one is they eliminate the cap, and the other is they raise the payroll tax rate very gradually by 2.4 percentage points, which is 
if you think about that out of 12.4, that's like a 20% increase in the tax rate. So the combination of those two things, limiting the cap and raising the rate, you know, by, by a quarter, can fix Social Security. And I think we should put both of those to be part of the solution personally. Um, why would I not prefer that plan to say another plan? Um, is because basically, if you raise the top rate, in that case, basically by 15%, you're pretty tapped out. Um, the ordinary top rate is 37%. With Medicare, it's basically 40%. That would put you at 55% um, with this payroll tax. Add in state and local taxes, in some cases, you're at 60 or 65%. You're pretty tapped out on what you can raise from the rich at that point. Um, and with finite dollars from the rich, I'd rather put more of it into other kinds of deficit reduction, into investments, into children, um, rather than into Social Security, which is both a lifeline for many seniors, but also a huge windfall for a lot of people that are in the wealthiest generation and cohort in, in the known universe, to repeat a phrase. And so um, I would absolutely, I absolutely think that we should look at lifting the cap and we should consider raising the tax rate. But I would, it would not be my preference to solve it entirely there because I'd rather, um, I'd rather raise that revenue elsewhere for other purposes. Um, and I think in Social Security, there are things we can do in the benefit formula that um, don't hurt people that rely on the program and, in fact, can encourage more economic growth because they encourage more savings and they encourage more work from, um, from many seniors that um, not only are contributing to the economy but would benefit in other kinds of ways as well. Hi, my name is Kathleen. Um, I'm curious how your team engages with MMT-based arguments about the national debt. I don't think there's any member of Congress that sort of like full-heartedly embraced it. Um, but yeah, curious how often that comes up and what your sort of like go-to responses this, tend to be. This is a great question. So the idea of MMT, I'm not sure even the MMT or no exactly the idea, but it's called Modern Monetary Theory. And I think my most charitable way to describe it is it starts with something, it starts with two premises that are pretty much true. The one is that the U.S. can't really default on its debt because we can print in our own currency. And the other is that one can manage the money supply, can manage borrowing by changing the money supply. Those two things are true, or can manage deficits. And then it sort of takes a whole shift it sort of turns out ahead how we look in the world. And MMT says, um, actually, all government spending is creating money, and all taxes are destroying money, which I think is not true other than, like, in, in some kind of, like, metaphor way. But they believe it. It's literally true. It's kind of, I don't want to get into, like, Catholicism and, like, whether it's the literal or whatever. But, like, I think they think it's literally true, just not metaphorically true. And because that's true, we really shouldn't try to change the money supply with monetary policy. The Federal Reserve really shouldn't do anything. And what we should do is manage the economy entirely through fiscal policy. Um, and, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of ands because the MMT has got increasingly layered. That usually means running very high deficits because debt doesn't matter because there is no debt because you're basically printing money. So it means running really high deficits to guarantee full employment. But deficits can be too high and you will see that through inflation. And that used to be where it ended. But then there was an additional but ended after we borrowed $2 trillion extra a year and had major inflation, which was the extra but was, but inflation may be caused by something else. And you don't want to raise taxes to fight inflation because I don't know why. We never said that. And it becomes very bizarre. I mean, I, I think that the experience of COVID really ended the, this idea of MMT because we sort of had a mini experiment. Um, we... Like, I think it's wrong theoretically, and I think it's wrong in practice. And it's wrong theoretically because I, I don't think it's true that spending money is the same as creating money and taxing money is the same as destroying money and that we can manage the macro economy through fiscal policy. And I think it's wrong in practice because I don't think Congress is literally capable of managing the macro economy through fiscal policy. That would require, when we had a big bout of inflation, them saying, okay, we're going to significantly reduce the deficit, right? We're going to 
have big tax rate increases, which all the MMTers div- disavowed as soon as there was the opportunity to do that, as soon as we had a big bout of inflation. And so, like, it's not going to work in practice. It doesn't work in theory. Um, it's very frustrating. But where I bring comfort is that, like, Stephanie Kelton, who's, like, the godmother of MMT, she was literally Bernie Sanders' chief economist when he was head of the Budget Committee. And Bernie Sanders is the person you would think would be pretty predisposed to believe in it because he's, you know, pretty left-wing as a democratic socialist. And Bernie Sanders didn't buy it at all. Um, he really, like, like, you look at his plan for president 2016, and, like, it was pretty radical, but guess what? He tried to pay for it. So, like, he had Medicare for all, but he also had huge tax increases to try to pay for it because he didn't believe that you could borrow unsustainably. So I, I think that it was gaining a lot of traction prior to 2019, and I think now that we've had um, two years of very high inflation following two years of big deficits, and the MMTers responded in the way they did, I think it's it really undermined their case. Like, sorry, I'm going to go on this for one more second, but I could have, if I was advising the MMTers, I would say, look, you could actually say, this proves that we are right, it's just that Congress went too far. You could have said, this proves the only consequence of borrowing is high inflation. And look, there was borrowing, there was high inflation, so now they need to have tax increases. The fact that they wouldn't say that, I think, shows that... It's maybe less of an economic philosophy and more of a political philosophy. More questions in the back? I'm just curious what your ideal solution is with respect to tax expenditures. If if you had the reins, what would you do? We have about, tax expenditure is like sort of, it's a tax break. It's called tax expenditure because a lot of them look a lot like spending. So for example, the difference between Pell Grants and the American Opportunity Tax Credit is that the Department of Education administers the Pell Grants, right? Otherwise, and you actually need the FAFSA form. So the difference is there's some accountability. But otherwise, it's kind of the same. So like, there's at minimum a gray line between what's a spending program and what's a tax break. Um, Tax expenditures sort of take a generous view about what's, Um, what's a diversion from the tax code. And under that view, we lose one and a half to two trillion dollars a year from these tax breaks. Some of them are really valuable. You know, they help keep people out of poverty and support work and um, help move us towards um, a lower emissions um, energy production. So some of them are really valuable. A lot of them, probably most of them, are really poor tar- poorly targeted for their role, their goal, and they go really disproportionately to the rich other than the credits, um, in part because the higher your rate, the more benefit you get. Like, if I deduct a dollar, my rate is 10%, I only get 10 cents back, but if my rate is 37%, I get 37 cents back. So, like, they're regressive, they mostly go to the rich, but they also distort behavior. The mortgage deduction causes people to buy bigger homes and borrow more for them. That doesn't make sense. The healthcare exclusion, we have very strong evidence, drives up healthcare prices, which are already, you know, 50% higher than the next highest country. Uh, All sorts of business tax breaks cause businesses to incorporate in certain kinds of ways or make certain kinds of investments that aren't good for their profit. They're good for their after-tax profit. That doesn't make any sense. Um, So we need comprehensive tax reform. We tried that in 2017. Like, the original vision they worked off of in 2017 was a plan called The Better Way. And it got rid of a lot of tax expenditures. It's just as they got through the sausage-making process, it turned out it was really politically hard. Um, one of the, I think, the best things that came out of 2017 is it barely touched the mortgage deduction. But because it raised the standard deduction so much and it reduced the state and local deduction so much, it actually sort of secretly got rid of the mortgage deduction for most people. That was a huge benefit that people don't even realize. So. You asked me my ideal. I'm now political strategizing, which is the opposite. Like, is there secret ways we can get rid of tax expenditures? But my non-secret way would be we ought to have a lot less of them. I mean, we ought to try to tax income equally across types of income. Um, You know, the tax code should have limited places where it's trying to incentivize behavior. And when it is, we need to look at it the same way we'd look at a spending program and actually evaluate, like, is this well targeted? But in general, we should have a broad base and low rates. And I'm, I'm willing to which is, I'm different from some tax economists. I'm willing to have a tax code that sort of on paper looks like it's actually more distorting to the economy 
um, because, say, rates on returns to investments are higher. If an exchange, it's less distorting across decisions um, because I think that our macroeconomic models aren't good at picking up the cost of getting people to make bad decisions, which is a lot of what our tax code does. Anything else? Wonderful. Well, let's thank Mark again for coming to see us and sharing your expertise. Thank you.